Hi, I'm Jay Rott for the Water Risk Company, Senior Service and Training Specialist. We're going to talk about some things that are detrimental to fire pumps. Main things are sand and foreign matter, corrosion, cavitation, overheating, and cold weather operation. We'll talk first about sand and foreign matter. No matter what water source you're operating from, you will have some type of sand or sediment in the water. Uh, water comes into the pump, goes into the eye of the impeller, taking the sand with it, comes out through the exit way, down the front shroud, and through the clearance between the wear ring and the impeller hub. The larger pieces of sand will get stuck in that clearance, and that will take the material out between the two pieces. And that will open up the clearance and bypass more and more water from the discharge side of the pump into the intake, and uh, bringing the efficiency of the pump down. Right. Which wears first, the expensive impeller or the inexpensive wear ring? Because the impeller is moving and the wear ring is stationary, the impeller actually sees 75% of the wear. So that is the primary point of wear inside the pump, is the hub of the impeller. WaterS does offer an option on smaller pumps, it's standard on the large pumps, anything with a U designation and the S100 and CX pumps, it's called tungsten carbide coating or flame plating. We turn the hub of the impeller down a few thousandths undersize and spray it with molten tungsten carbide that impregnates into the, the bronze. It makes it a very hard material. So as that sand comes down through that clearance, it's going to take longer to wear that material away and make the pump last longer. Right. Intake screens. Main function is to keep large items out of the pump. General rule, whatever goes through the strainer will go through the impeller and out to your discharge. Picture here shows stones that are stuck in the strainer. That's what it's doing, it's keeping the large items out of the pump. Here's a picture of a stud stuck in the eye of the impeller. Here's a picture of an impeller damaged by a grade A bolt. Okay. Those items get into the pump, it will damage the pump. Taking care of the pump, as far as a good idea on a regular basis, drain the pump. Uh, there's about 15 to 20 gallons of water inside that pump. If you open the drains up, any sand, sediment inside the pump will drain out and get out of the system. Because you have a lot of different types of material inside the system, you have bronze, cast iron, stainless steel, you have water, air, you're going to get a corrosion effect called galvanic corrosion. But it's going to attack the most susceptible material in the system, which is the cast iron body. Okay, and that's going to corrode. So the strainers are made out of zinc. They're a sacrificial anode. So they are going to corrode away before the cast iron body does. Right? So this is what it ends up looking like if it's not checked and changed on a regular basis. Typically on an annual test. Take your valves off to, to run your annual test. You also check your strainers at the same time to make sure they're in good condition. As far as installing the strainer, it needs to be installed correctly. Uh, you need a good metal-to-metal -metal contact between the outside ring and the intake fitting to make it act as an anode. Okay, so and the, in the intake fitting, take a uh, emery cloth or steel wool, clean the bore out where this will fit, so it has good metal-to-metal -metal contact around the outside. You also want it uh, tight in there, you don't want it bouncing around loose. So the outside ring is cut. So put this in a vise, bend out carefully on the outside of the part that's cut. Don't bend too far or you'll damage the rib. But bend that out, put it into the intake fitting, push up on it, push into the fitting, and that will push it tight and that will keep a good metal to metal contact between the strainer and your cast iron intake fitting. Right. You can also add anodes to the system as well. To again, add extra protection to protect the pump body from corrosion. Cavitation. Running the pump too fast for the amount of water you're supplying in the eye. Right. Now, typical sign of cavitation. A rock or gravel noise on the inside of the pump. Okay. Non-corresponding rise in RPMs and pressure. As you bring the RPMs up, the pressure should come with it. If you bring the RPMs up, the pressure stops, starts to bounce, you're cavitating the pump. So why that's detrimental on the inside of the pump is the fact that you're not filling the impeller with water. You have voids on the inside of the pump, air pockets. And those air pockets result in actually creating a vacuum in the eye of the impeller. 
Okay? And as you create a vacuum, water boils, but whatever temperature it is. Okay? So what happens is you get bubbles forming in the eye of the impeller. As those bubbles are flowed towards the exit way, as the water is discharged out, the bubbles go with it. Okay? Those bubbles, or vapor, uh, collapse as they hit the outside or towards the outside of the impeller, the high pressure area. And the rock or gravel noise I mentioned earlier is that bubble or vapor collapsing, going back into water. Okay? And what it does is it chips away at the bronze. Where the veins attached to the shroud in that 90 degree corner, okay, it implodes in that area and it's going to chip away. That, that uh, going back into water basically is also called an implosion. And it chips away at the bronze, it will end up destroying the impeller. Not the first time, second time, or third time you cavitate, but if you continue to cavitate the pump, you will end up destroying the impeller. Okay, the only way to correct cavitation is either slow the pump down or supply more water to the pump. Recirculation cavitation. This type of cavitation is found on large pumps. Single stage pumps are great pumps, but they're, they're volume pumps. Okay, and they're, at, they're most efficient at or near capacity of the pump. If you're flowing this, this impeller at high pressure, low flows. You create pressure by RPM and velocity, how fast you turn your impeller. Okay, so you're creating that pressure by increasing that velocity out into the pump, but the water still has to go someplace. And it goes down the shrouds back into the eyes at higher rates. You end up with recirculation cavitation. How do you overheat a pump? Typically two ways. First way is not having water in the pump. Second way is not flowing water or deadheading the pump it's called. Uh, you bring energy into the system to move the water to the discharge side of the pump and out of the pump assembly. Uh, when you deadhead it, you overheat the water in the eye of the impeller and it starts to boil. Okay? As it gets hot, it starts to destroy the packing, mechanical seals, discharge valves. Worst case scenario or the catastrophic failure is metal, as it gets hot, swells or expands. As it gets larger, the hub of the impeller will swell out to the point where it will hit the wear ring and it will start to destroy those two pieces. Worst case scenario is the hub of the impeller seizes to the wear ring. As those two pieces seize together, it will turn inside the pump body and destroy the bore of the pump that was holding the wear ring in place. So moving water is the way to keep a pump cool. You have recirculation line uh, coming off the discharge side of the pump. If you have a small quarter turn valve, it's usually a half inch line that runs from the discharge side of the pump up into the tank, where it dissipates the heat in the volume of water you have in your tank. Okay? Uh, or you have a tank fill slash recirculation valve. What you're gonna do though, when you use it for a recirc line, is to bypass water again from the discharge side of the pump into the tank where it dissipates the heat in the volume of water you have in your tank. Typical way to tell if your pump is overheating is touching the intake fitting. Cast iron is a very good conductor of heat. Uh, as you feel it here on the intake fitting, pump is getting warm on the inside, you're gonna feel it. Some of the water's company offers is an overheat protection manager. You have two parts to the system. You have a dump valve coming off the center discharge of the midship style pump, or it can be plumbed into a different port on an end suction or a different uh, type of pump. That dumps at 140 degrees and resets at 130. Uh, you have another part of the system that have a sensor that goes off at 180 degrees. That will turn a light on on your pump panel that starts to flash telling that you're overheating the pump. An audible alarm is also available for that. Obviously we started dumping at 140. We started warning at 180. It's possible to go right on past that point as far as your temperature. The system is really there to help warn you and help protect you a small amount in the beginning but warn you to let you know that something's going on with the pump and you need to flow water to cool the pump and get it back to operating conditions. You can be retrofitted to other pumps as well or to pumps before 2001 by adding a flange out to a discharge fitting uh, to, um, to sense that temperature rise. All right. Cold weather operation. Uh, official recommendation from Waterus, if the pump is going to be exposed to freezing conditions, uh, you drain the pump. If there's no water in the pump, it can't freeze. Okay. If you are going to run a wet pump, you need to get the pump engaged as soon as possible once you get to the fire scene to get water moving. Okay? Typically, depending on the, how cold it is, it, moving water will not freeze. 
right? Colder climates, we do put belly pans on the bottom of the trucks, so the pump compartment is enclosed. The exhaust runs through there, keeps the pump warm. Uh, you go farther north, cl northern climates, you're going to have heaters on the inside of the pump compartment to help that as well. Okay? This is what happens on a frozen pump. You see a priming valve where it popped or blew the cap off of it. This is a discharge valve. Okay, it was destroyed when water got inside and froze and expanded the cast iron. This is an intake uh, fitting. It's a Monarch butterfly behind it, so you can see the, the ice built up on the inside when they took the cap off. Okay. It will destroy that pump uh, if it's left to freeze. 